Welcome back to Subbrief. I'm your host, Aaron. Today we're talking about Russia's most capable submarine, the K-329 Belgorod. Let's get started. Our story of the Belgorod begins in July 1992 when they laid the keel for another Project 949 Alpha boat, the Oscar II program in machine shop number 55 and assign it tactical number K-329. In 1993, the following year, K-329 receives its honorary name, Belgorod, named after a Russian city. Two years later, in 1995, a crew is formed and begins training in Obninsk, Russia. Obninsk, maybe uh, you may know of it because of its uh, training reactor. It's got one of the earliest reactors in Russian history there, and it's used for not only powering the city, but also for training. So that's where the crew was gonna go and do the primary training as the submarine is being constructed in the shipyard. In 1997 though, the project is put on hold and there is no clear reason given for why it's put on hold, but it can be assumed it's due to lack of money. In the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia didn't have a lot, a lot of money to manage and maintain its military, much less build new submarines. So like many projects, this one was put on hold. In 1998, the crew is still training in hopes of having a submarine one day to go to, uh, but the submarine's not going to be ready before the crew is, and they disband the crew from their training classes. So where is the submarine now? It's sitting in the uh, Severance machine shop in uh, the 1990s in one of the assembly buildings you see here. Uh, if you look inside the assembly buildings, the pictures in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the cranes that they use to move all these large pieces of metal and uh, assemble ships and submarines, often more than one at a time, in these buildings. Now, Sevmash, which is the common vernacular for Severance Machine Shop, is one of the more famous shipyards in Russia. It has the highest craftsmanship standard of any uh, shipyard in Russia, much to the chagrin of the Admiralty Shipyard down in St. Petersburg, which certainly is a close second. But the Sevmash holds a very high bar that all the other shipyards try to attain. And that's where K329 is laying in wait to be completed. You can see it's there north of Moscow uh, on the shores of the White Sea, which is connected to the Barents Sea. That little body of water next to the red mark is where they do a lot of their initial sea testing. And then they'll go out into the Barents Sea for further long-term testing. In the year 2000, everyone around the world is talking about new projects and making Russia great again. And one of the things that they're going to do is restart some of these old submarines that have been lying in wait unfinished in the shipyards around the country. K-329 is one of them. They're going to restart it under the anti-modernized or the Oscar II modernized program called 949AM. But as with many of these millennial plans, there's a lot of celebration and talk, but no money is ever allocated to finishing the projects. So for years, the submarine continues to wait in the assembly building to be finished. In 2004, an assessment is done as to what it would take to finish K-329. Uh, essentially, her hull is complete, but it's empty of equipment on the inside. Her tubes are empty, and this source is translated from Russian, and the word emptied is a little ambiguous. The tubes are either installed and have no missiles on them, which would make sense, seeing as how it's in an assembly building, or the missile tubes most likely aren't even installed yet, which is a big part of the estimated 100 million rubles cost to finish K-329. This is certainly a low ball estimate. It almost certainly would take more money than that to finish the submarine at this point. Two years go by and India steps in in 2006 and says, hey, we will pay to finish the construction of this Oscar II modernized K-329 if India can lease it for 10 years. This is very common. They did this with a 
uh, Charlie 2 SSGN. They have an Akula 2 right now under lease that they paid to finish construction of. And in 2006, they're offering to do this again for this Oscar 2. For whatever reason, that does not happen. Either Russia did not want to transfer the technology to India, because this would be a big uh, tactical upgrade for the Indian Navy if they got one of these, or India did not come through with their money as part of the bargain. And considering how they didn't always pay on time for the Charlie and the Akula, that could likely be the case as well, or both. So, but for whatever reason, in 2006, India did not get the contract to complete K-329. In 2009, uh, Admiral Vladimir Vatsky announces the freezing of Project 949AM. There will be no more Oscar IIs, including the one on the dry dock. So what are we talking about, the Oscar II here? The Oscar II is the Soviet Union's 1980s answer to the NATO um, carrier convoy. This is the carrier killer that they um, built in the mid and early 90s, mid 80s, early 90s. Uh, its primary weapon is an anti-ship missile called the P-700 Granite, which is a long-range autonomous homing anti-ship missile with an enormous warhead. Uh, this Oscar II carries 24 of these missiles and can launch all of them in one salvo. And that's the idea is to get within about 100 miles or so of the target fleet and shoot the entire bank of 24 missiles at the fleet. What happens in flight with this P-700 missile is pretty incredible for 1980s technology for this missile is the missiles do a count after they're launched via a data link of who is in the group. And they assign one missile to be the leader or the scout as they're skimming across the water at over Mach 1, over, faster than the speed of sound. One missile is designated to rise up to a high altitude over a thousand meters, turn on its radar and do the search. Whatever targets it sees at the target waypoint, it shares that data with the other missiles in the group, up to 23 other missiles and in any one group. And they each are designated their own target based on one missile's information. If that scout missile is destroyed, another missile is chosen to be the leader, goes up and continues the search. Once the targets have been assigned, the missiles go after their targets. And because they're traveling at faster than the speed of sound, this does not take long to, to get from the launch to the end point. This happens very quickly. And so this was a very devastating, Aegis-defeating, carrier-killing tactic, platform, and weapon system that they deployed in the 80s and 90s. India wanted one of these, and it would have made India the dominant naval force uh, going forward in the 90s and 2000s if they had gotten one, but they didn't. In addition to this massive anti-ship capability, they still have standard uh, weapon systems, torpedoes, including the Shekval, um, you know, uh, high-speed torpedo. It can do, you know, it's a cavitating torpedo. It runs in a bubble. It goes faster than 100 or approximately 100 knots out to a target. Um, the UGST is the best thermal torpedo that Russia had at the time. It can shoot that. It's a 53-centimeter torpedo. So they have a full room of weapons as well, torpedo room as weapons. Uh, they have the latest communication, whether it's radar, sonar, and comms, and a relatively quiet engine room similar to one used on the Akula. So the Oscar II is a very powerful platform, and it wouldn't surprise me if Russia chose not to sell this, even in the 2000s. This is what we're beginning with. This is what Belgrade was to be, but never became. 2012, years later, comes along, and Admiral Valsky announces that Sevmas Shipyard will continue the construction of Belgrade from its current project of 949 AM to Special Purpose Submarine Project 09852. So this is now the third project this same hall has been on. That same year, uh, President Putin is elected uh, president of Russia, which includes a change of leadership in the Navy, and Admiral Viktor Chirkov is assigned um, 
in charge of the Navy. You may know his name because he was uh, in charge of the Baltic Fleet, Black Sea Fleet, whenever they invaded the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. Admiral Cherkov was in charge of the naval tactics and maneuvers during uh, the seizure of Crimea. Anyway, so in December of 2012, Admiral Cherkov assigns the certificate to relay the keel, now for the second or third time of Belgrade, to a special purpose submarine. And that program continues to 2018. You can see here at the bottom what they've done. They've extended the length of the submarine in numerous areas, making this the longest submarine ever built, ever commissioned. This is the longest one of any Navy in the world. They've added eight meters to the bow. That is to help hold the new Poseidon nuclear torpedo that we'll talk about. They inserted a new section, a whole new compartment that's 18 meters long for docking mini deep submergent submarines and autonomous U, uh, unmanned vehicles. And they've extended the engine room eight meters as well. Overall length, 178 meters, one of the longest, or it is the longest submarine in the world. April 23rd, 2019, the Belgrade finally launches under the supervision of President Putin via uh, a satellite connection. It is a solemn ceremony that includes a priest where they bless the crew, they bless the submarine, uh, they smash the uh, champagne bottle on it, and they roll it out of the assembly building. Uh, after about 17 years of construction, she finally sees the light of day outside this assembly building. So here she is in June 2019, satellite photos and uh, a local photo, it looks like there, uh, of the Belgrade doing dockside testing. The systems she's testing at this point are for four programs. The Poseidon nuclear weapon, the Low Shark Auxiliary Submarine, Deep Submergent Submarine, Mini Sub, uh, Shelf, a nuclear power pod, and the Harpsichord 2 ppm Calvson, which is the autonomous underwater vehicle that will dock onto the top of the submarine. The Low Shark docks under the bottom. It has people in that one. The unmanned underwater surveillance docks at the top. So those are the four systems. The first one we're going to talk about is Status 6 Canyon. That's the Russian designation for the program. NATO name is Poseidon. This is an autonomous, and this is a key word. This is a self-operating, AI-enhanced nuclear propulsion torpedo that has a nuclear warhead that is measured in the tens of megatons, implying somewhere between 20 and 90 megatons of power in this warhead. This is the Poseidon. It is a nuclear propulsion propelled torpedo. Uh, the nuclear propulsion can last a minimum of seven months without maintenance, probably longer, and the actual reactor vessel itself can last up to 20 years. Obviously, it can't deploy 20 years without maintenance, but it can do seven months minimum without any maintenance. So this huge torpedo that is six and a half feet in diameter, okay, greater than the height of most people, just in diameter, can roam the oceans for at least seven months with a nuclear warhead on board waiting for orders to, to deploy. The Belgrade can carry six of these. So she could, in theory, go out into the Atlantic because she's based out of uh, the Kola Peninsula, which is on the Atlantic side of Russia, and shoot six of these and let them roam around for six months doing racetrack patterns in the middle of the deep waters of the North Atlantic, and then autonomously drive back to their uh, base or even the White Sea where they can easily be recovered by Russian forces. That's not a tactic we've seen yet. The, uh, the canyon did do sea trials in 2019, so this weapon is in the water being tested, uh, but just one purpose, one use of this weapon could be to have it loiter off the coastlines of countries around the globe for months at a time. The Low Shark is a uh, manned mini sub that docks with a Belgorod on the bottom. Uh, it is part of Project 10831. And this is part of the Main Directorate Deep Sea Research, or GUGI, um, program. And that's kind of a, it's a slang term for, you know, underwater spying, even though this is 
It's supposed to be for scientific research and surveying, which it can do. It can also just as easily collect intelligence, uh, find and tap undersea internet and communication cables, which it does do. We watch them do this. Um, so it's a dual purpose submarine. It has a scientific mission and it has an intelligence gathering mission as well. It can dive as deep as 3000 feet, very deep diving submarine. And it has the tools on board to manipulate things on the bottom, like pick up um, anything that it finds or place things like hydrophones or whatnot and carry payloads to and from the sea floor. Sadly, in 2019, there was a catastrophic fire that burned out most of the interior of the Low Shark while she was underway, killing many of the crew. She did manage to get to the surface and was brought back to port and has been under repair since July 2019. There you can see the memorial they put up for her. Sadly, like the Kursk, this happened very close to shore in relatively shallow water, but it doesn't take much to uh, lose your submarine and a crew uh, once you get out past a couple hundred feet. Shelf. So this is the third project Belgrade is related to. Shelf is a nuclear automated turbine generator. It is a pressure hull with a nuclear reactor and a turbine generator uh, joined inside, and it can run for 5,000 hours at a time, that's months at a time, without any human interaction. It only generates about 44 kilowatts of electricity, which for a nuclear reactor is not much, but the places they can put this, like under the ice in the Arctic Sea or Arctic Ocean, is, is a great, it doesn't need to have a lot of power. Just having any power at all uh, down under the ice is great for uh, things like the Harmony Array that they're building down there. It also supports electrical, uh, or provides electricity for deep sea oil drilling that's going on in the Arctic right now. Um, so this supports surveying, drilling, and uh, hydroacoustic sensors for months at a time with 44 kilowatts of electricity. It's called Shelf. Shelf gets to and from its target on the back of the Belgrad, and the Low Shark carries it down to the sea floor and back. So now you see how some of these programs are working together. And finally, Harpsichord 2 p.m. I'm sorry, 2 p.m. Clavson is an autonomous deep diving side scan sonar vehicle. This one is unmanned. It docks on the top of the Belgrad. It has a little hanger up there. And it's instructed uh, before it leaves the ship as to what it's supposed to do. It goes out, it does that. The Belgrade can maneuver while it's doing its mission. And it knows where the Belgrade is and will come back and dock itself. It's 100% autonomous. It has artificial intelligence. All it needs is some guidelines, which it's given before the mission. And it goes out and does this. Together, these are all very advanced systems that work together. And Russia has this in the water right now doing testing. Testing is supposed to be complete at the end of 2020. However, at the time of this recording, I cannot confirm that testing is complete. But going into 2021, we can assume that these devices, including that Poseidon nuclear torpedo, is available for the Russian Navy to use. So here is a great cutaway that H.I. Sutton um, put together. I encourage everyone to go to hisutton.com if you want to learn more about the Belgorod Project 09852 Special Mission Submarine. He did a great job kind of putting everything we talked about today into one picture, and you can sit there and uh, read all about it. He does a great breakdown of this. There's actually a couple articles about this by, by now. This is a deep sea research submarine that does undersea logistics support. That's going back to those oil uh, drilling rigs. It does intelligence reconnaissance and is a nuclear weapons platform. This is a military target. And in 2021, we can expect it to be operational. All right, again, I want to thank you uh, for everyone that's helped me put this together. This one was a very interesting um, subbrief to put together because of the recentness of this program. Most of it is classified, you know, and not public knowledge. So I had to work closely with Mr. Sutton and his website. Also, Oleg Kushov, thank you for the photographs. And deepstorm.ru is a great source for unclassified uh, Russian information about their operations. So thank you to uh, everyone who helped me put these together, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, everybody.